Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. The new set of guidelines issued by the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NFIU, which seek to spell out the financial relationship between state and local governments, have been causing some apprehension among the governors. With financial autonomy for government at the grassroots, a fundamental demand of those who have been pushing the restructuring narrative, what then should be the way to go? And how can transparency and accountability hold sway if and when local governments begin to manage their own finances? For answers to these and more, we are now being joined from our Arise Abuja studio by Hamzat Lawa, the co-founder of an advocacy group called Connected Development, or CODE for short. And he's also a principal promoter of the Follow the Money initiative. Hamzat Lawa, welcome to the program. Good, Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Hamzat. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Good morning. Good I to have you here on the that. program. Yes. But first, uh, before we get into the issue of uh, uh, local government fiscal autonomy, can you tell us a little about this thing you call Follow the Money Initiative? What is it all about? What's the focus of your advocacy? In 2012, in 2012 I started Follow the Money from the demand to ensure that over 1,500 children access uh, life-saving health care needs in Zanfara State. And at that time, we advocated for and tracked the release of $5.3 million. Uh, today, that's over 900 million naira. Follow the Money tries to answer where funds are coming from, where they're going to, but most importantly, how judiciously these funds are being utilized, particularly at the grassroots. And this is the largest social accountability movement, uh, a homegrown initiative that started in Nigeria, now in four African countries. And we have over 6,000 volunteers on ifollowthemoney.org. Okay, good. Now, I mean, this issue about the NFIU guidelines, the uh, Financial Intelligence Unit issued uh, guidelines uh, May 31, 2019, effective June 1, about how, you know, local government funds should be handled. But the governors, they've been kicking since then. They insist that this is uh, completely in violation of Section 7, Subsection 6 of the uh, 1999 Constitution, and also uh, Section uh, 162, uh, subsection 678 of the uh, 1999 Constitution. Indeed, they accused the Financial Intelligence Unit of acting ultra, ultra virus, dabbling into, you know, what does not uh, uh, concern it, you know, uh, embarking on a busybody trip, claiming that, you know, they would uh, offer guidelines for how local government funds uh, should be managed. The governors have not given up since then. What is the way out of this, in your view? I think, I think that, uh, yes, uh, this is where the National Assembly comes to play. And if the governors are aggrieved, they should approach the Supreme Court. But then again, in principle, why would the governors be against a policy or a regulation that hopes to provide financial autonomy to local governments? Mind you, local government is where the grassroots is, and this is where you bring development closer to the people. Why would he be against the policy that ensure that resources are meant for local government and grassroots communities are used judiciously? So, so for me, I, I've always said, whoever is against this policy is against Nigeria's democratic dispensation and it's against good governance. Why can't the governors embrace this uh, 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 ambitious policy and ensure that they provide oversight and, and allow their local government uh, chairman and councillors use this money judiciously? Today, if you go to various grassroots communities, they don't have uh, primary health care centers that are well functional. They don't have primary schools that can administer children back to school. Today, we're talking about over 10 million children that are out of school in Nigeria. And the role of the local government is to bring development closer to the people. So if resources that are meant to local government are now being directed to local government and NFIU providing oversight and ensuring that uh, chairman cannot disburse or withdraw 500,000 are a cash per day, then this is a welcome development. Nigeria is talking about curbing illicit financial flow. Today, we don't even know who is funding local uh, terrorist group that are causing harm and mayhem in the Nigerian grassroots. And then you have a, 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 the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit saying, come, let us close these loopholes. Let us work hand in hand and ensure that resources that are meant for good in grassroots communities are being put to use. So I see no reason why the Nigerian Governors Forum 
you know, would raise the dust where there is none. But then again, if they really want to ensure that it is addressed, they should approach the Supreme Court. But I want to also say that the National Assembly have an opportunity here to amend the Constitution and those sections that is providing bottleneck and ensuring that monies that are meant to the local government go to them. See, today we run a federal government, which means, or rather a federation, local, state, and national government. And there's a joint account by these three tiers of government. And then at the state level, there's a joint account between the state government and the local government. Why would the state governors want to administer resources that are meant for local government? Very good, very good question that you ask and very good points that you make there. And it's quite a worrying situation because one would think or hope that these guidelines would sort of motivate states to really act on how they can develop their IGR more. But that doesn't seem to be the case. However, this is probably the first time the local government chairmen have this level of autonomy over their funds. But even though they have that, they are still under a microscope because part of the guidelines also state, for example, that they're not allowed to spend the money until salaries have been paid, right? So it means that they too are under a microscope and it's not as if they have the money as some sort of free for all. But my question to you, Mr. Lawal, is... Are you confident that our local government chairmen are also able to ensure that this money is used in the most sustainable and appropriate way? Can we trust in our local government chairmen more than we are able to trust in our governors? Or do you just think that the money is in the hands of others who still may not actually disperse the funds in the right way? You know, the citizens at the various uh, 774 local government have given the mandate to this local government. So if we like, we trust them or not, they have been duly elected as local government chairmen and councillors in this local government. But I think that, again, democracy is about supply and demand. Even after elections, citizens also are mandated to ensure that they hold government to account, irrespective of what they choose to do. Because if you don't hold government to account, then they would use public resources for their own personal gain. I, I believe that, first, there's an opportunity, one, Federal government and, and state and local government needs to also make public how much money they accrue monthly from the federation account. After that, I believe that also, and if you follow governance, local government have their budget. They have both their overhead and their capital expenditure. And this is where citizens can also increase demand and say, use most of this money after you pay salary, because it's a local government that is meant to pay salaries for teachers and primary health care workers. After you pay salaries, also invest in infrastructure, build roads, build bridges, so that farms, or rather farmers can take their farm produce, you know, into the market. So that, you know, today we can cop the over 10 million out of school children because most of these children are in the local government. So, again, there's an opportunity. And mind you, NFI, you say, we would monitor the disbursement of these funds. We will monitor the utilization of these funds. Because today, when corrupt politicians want to embezzle money, they would go and withdraw uh, uh, cash. So what they're saying you cannot withdraw cash above 500,000 naira daily. Ensure that you, uh, you pay electronically. And if we flag any payment, we're going to freeze it and then call you to want it. And mind you, they're also collaborating with the Economic Financial uh, EFCC. So if you are find wanting, EFCC would come and arrest you and prosecute you. I believe that if we want to fight corruption, if we're able to tackle local government management of resources, then maybe we might have a headway. But also, mind you, we're talking about the Sustainable Development Goal and how Nigeria can achieve the Sustainable Development Goal, and particularly around, around local government. Today, when we have conversation in Nigeria, everyone focuses on federal government. What is Buhari doing? I think now is the time for citizens to go and ask their various local government chairman, what are you doing? As their state executive governors, what are you doing? I, I would also tell one quick story. I got a phone call from a chairman in Yobi State and said since he's been a chairman, he has never received that amount of cash. They confirmed that he got over 150 million uh, dur uh, during the last disbursement of funds. And they were quite excited. But then there's a gap here. They don't even have a consolidated payment platform for salaries. They don't even have structures to utilize this money. Because for you to withdraw, you must put it, if you look at the guideline, you must put in place structures to access this money. So the fact that you also have autonomy in, in, in utilizing these funds, if you don't have structures, then you cannot access or utilize these resources. So there's a gap. There's a human capital gap. There's a structural and systemic gap that uh, partners and civil society and other donor agencies have to help them fill. Well, I'm sad. You referred earlier to the role of the National Assembly. And I guess by that you mean that, you know, maybe the legal framework will need to be uh, redefined. 
because the governors are insisting that, you know, what they do so far is backed by the uh, Constitution, which creates a state government, uh, joint local government account. Now, the uh, National Assembly in 2017 indeed tried to uh, amend the Constitution to ensure local government autonomy. But the, you know the Constitution also requires that, you know, this will be forwarded to the states for voting and adoption. Now, the, uh, that particular section of the uh, constitutional amendment could not get the concurrence of uh, state houses of assembly. The state houses of assembly just refused uh, to vote to ensure uh, local government autonomy. Now, with that in place, do you have any hope that that legal framework will ever at any time uh, be revised? Well, I have hope. And mind you, Nigeria is a young democracy and will keep evolving. It's no longer news that our state house of assembly, you know, is being controlled by the executive governors. So let's not sugarcoat here. That's the reality. And for you to amend the constitution, after you get to third majority at the House and Senate, you need to forward it and get to third majority. And what this means is you need 24 state house of assembly to vote yes for this amendment, and then it's being transmitted for presidential assent. And we know that if the state executive governors are controlling their state assembly, then this bill would never see the light of the day. But then again, we've always advocated for separation of power. Because if we don't have separation of power and you're not independent as a state assembly and you allow yourself to be controlled by the executive governors, then citizens at the grassroots will not enjoy the dividends of democracy. Uh, and then we'll have more apprehension. I believe that there's an opportunity here for state assembly to rise to the occasion beyond the national assembly that are uh, and now even supporting the NFIU policy guideline. I believe the state assembly have a key role to play. And, and, and if they do play this key role, then before the expiration of this dispensation, maybe we'll be able to amend the constitution and allow our local government to be both administratively and financially autonomy in dispensing you know, the dividends of democracy at the grassroots. Absolutely, Mr. Lawal. We are going to go on a very quick break in a couple seconds. So I'll I'll uh, pose a question, and when we're back, you can answer it. But it is with regards to a framework now. What sort of framework do we need to see from the federal government to really support local government areas and chairmen if we really want this new policy and guideline to work? So I'll leave that for you to think about. We'll go on a quick commercial break. And, of course, when we're back, the conversation continues. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching The Morning Show here on Arise News. And still with us in our Abuja studios is Mr. Hamzat Lawal, the co-founder of an advocacy group, Connected Development, also known as CODE, and the founder of the Follow the Money Initiative. Welcome back to the program, Mr. Lawal. Before we went on a break, I asked you a question with regards to what framework the federal government needs to put in place to really support this guideline for the local government chairmen and areas, especially because it's sort of posing a threat to the governors, and it could lead some governors to want to deliberately disenfranchise local government areas. Yes, I believe that the federal government could help increase the capacity of these local government chairmen. A lot of them do not understand what local governance is all about. Sadly, uh, we've really reduced you know, the expectations of public office holders whereby we'd rather focus on individuals rather than institutions. So I believe that, you know, the federal government needs to bring together all the 704 local government chairmen, uh, bring personnel from NFIU, from EFCC, to enhance their capacity and knowledge and make them understand their role in ensuring that they provide that administrative and financial autonomy and independence and uh, uh, interference from the state's governors. Uh, uh, also, we also need to ensure that we need to amend the Constitution, particularly the Electoral Act. Today, it is the state governors that oversee elections at the state level. Today, some, local, some states have not conducted local government elections. I think that we should bring this under the purview of INEC. Let INEC be the only institutions that conduct elections in Nigeria, both be it federal, state, or local government elections. If we can do that, then truly we can provide independence to the local government and allow citizens enjoy the dividends of democracy in, uh, in, at the grassroots. So 
So for me, it's about enhancing you know, their knowledge, their capacity, and also providing stronger regulations around them. And, and hopefully, the National Assembly and State Assembly would rise to the occasions. Because, because if they don't, uh, and, and, and of course, the judiciary have a role to play. They need to also translate the Constitution so that this crisis would not linger for, for far too long. Yes, uh, Amzat, I mean, you've raised two very interesting issues. We started with uh, fiscal autonomy for local governments, and then you have now raised the issue of political autonomy uh, for local councils. Uh, if you were to place the two side by side, which do you think should come first, considering the fact that, yes, you may have financial autonomy, but at the same time, the state independent electoral commissions are more or less controlled by uh, the uh, state governors. That's one side of the question. The second side is, uh, what do you think of uh, financial autonomy also for state legislature and also for state judiciary? Oh, fantastic question. Again, if we would enjoy the dividends of democracy and governance, we must ensure that these institutions are independent. Because see, today in Nigeria, we have rather strong individuals rather than stronger institutions. So, we need autonomy both financially and politically for the local government councils. We need autonomy both financial and political for state assembly. And of course, for our judiciary. See, if, this in, if these institutions are not independent administratively or financially, mind you, they might be in, independent administratively, but it, we all know it's all about the money. Politics, it's about money. And the person who controls this money or the resources controls, the, they say the piper controls the tune, right? So. Whoever controls these resources controls the person ad, who is meant to administer the resources. So it's very, in the, it's very important that the National Assembly look at the amendment holistically. So it's not just about providing administrative autonomy, but financial autonomy, so that all these institutions get their resources directly from the CBN. And it must, it must be a constitutional mandate. Mm -hmm. It must be a constitutional mandate, but how do you really think the National Assembly are going to react to this request? I say this because, I mean, the Federal High Court in Abuja by Justice John Soho had already ruled out and declined the governor's request. And then they went to the National Assembly, clearly trying to seek more support against the NFIU guidelines. But how do you really think the National Assembly are going to come out and react to the governor's request? Do you see the National Assembly veering more towards support for the governors? Or do you see them standing with the Federal High Court, the NFIU, and maybe also a lot of other Nigerians that are not in support of the governors on this? I'm aware that the Senate had stand uh, behind NFIU and have supported the NFIU's policy. Uh, and we also know that you know, this whole NFIU saga with the governor and NFIU in the federal government would also determine President Muhammadu Buhari's achievement in terms of fighting corruption in Nigeria. Because you cannot provide lip service in fighting corruption if you don't ensure that you provide a policy and regulatory framework. And this would also play a key role in the lead up to the 2023 elections. Even if we try to shy away from it, this is politics. This is politics because managing resources and controlling resources is political. So, so again, uh, this, this is quite big. It's big because, again, when, when the politics kick in in 2022, the NFIU's role and the governor's role would, would come into play, and, and then, then negotiation would start. But I believe that we need to, if we say we're fighting corruption, if we say we want to tackle illicit financial flow, if we say that we want to provide dividends of democracy, and mind you, this would also... Uh, this would also, if you look at the trend during the, uh, ahead of the 2023 elections, if we don't get it right, this might also lead to voter apathy. Because if citizens have come out to vote in 2019, and then they don't enjoy dividends of democracy, particularly at the grassroots, and mind you, over 90% of Nigeria's vote comes from the grassroots. So if they don't enjoy dividends of democracy, 20, ahead of 2023, a lot of people will not want to come out to vote because they would say, well, what is the value of my vote if I don't enjoy portable drinking water, primary health care services, and my children cannot go to school and get access to education? Well, uh, Amzat, let me uh, give you an example of Lagos State. In Lagos State, for example, you have what they call SCDAs, Local Council Development Areas. Now, these SCDAs, they are, they are a creation of uh, the Lagos State Government. They are not covered under the 774 local councils listed in the Constitution, which means that whatever local council allocation that comes to uh, Lagos State 
is shared by the uh, state government. The state government, in this case, relying on Section 7, Subsection 6 you know, of, the, uh, of the Constitution and Section 162, Subsection 6. Now, Lagos State is saying, if you pay directly to the local councils, how would the state government take care of those LCDAs that have been, uh, you know, created to take development closer to, uh, uh, to the grassroots? And I guess there are one or two other states where you have this, you know, state creation called uh, LCDAs. How do you address that? Because that was a poser that was raised by people defending the interest of Lagos State. But, but mind you, uh, even if as much we have this uh, regulatory framework in Lagos State, Lagos State is one of the states that don't even need federal government allocation to run. This is the state that has the highest IGR in Nigeria. But then again, the state has its own budget. And of course, the state also have a role to provide oversight in this local government in their area. So if they created an agency that is effectively meant to provide oversight and administer development in the local government, then they can use their state budget or state allocated resources to pay for overhead and, and engage those personnel. But it is, a, let's, let's even look at it, let's, let's drop the constitution. Let's even look at it from you know, a, 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 a very positive point of view. If these resources go directly to the local government, are we not saying that we're also empowering local government to, and people at the local government to be able to see development closer to themselves? You know, let's, let's do away with the constitution. Let's do away with all these regulations. Let's even look, you know, at what is, the, what is rightfully done, even in other climes, you know, in the United States, because we always quote the United States. Today, you know, we have counties that are independent and, and run the affairs of governance in their county using both resources they generate and resources they get, you know, uh, from Washington, D.C. So, so let's, let's look at it holistically. Lagos State, I bet, is a state that every other state should go and copy their model, how they're able to generate revenue, how they're able to sustain themselves even. Out, because I remember during the reign of Ahmed Tenebu, uh, he, there was a time he had a disagreement with the federal government, and he was able to run his state effectively. He didn't owe salary using the funds that he internally generated in Lagos State. And I was, there was a time he quoted and said he don't even need revenues from the federal government. And I think that Nigeria needs, if we need to develop as a country, we need to ensure that our local government and our state are able to re generate revenues where they would use that revenue for the good of the people that are residing in you know, in this uh, uh, state or local government, as the case may be. And see, we need to also look at, I think here's an opportunity to have a conversation of diversifying our economy because we cannot provide lift service. Today, once the price of oil goes down, then, then we all have colds and we're sneezing. I think that the government needs to truly diversify economy and allow not just uh, autonomy in terms of politically, administratively, and financially, but also give a benchmark or give you know, a, a, a target to all the state and local governments. So when they are able to effectively run and generate resources, nobody would always want to come to Abuja or the commissioners at the end of the month or the fi uh, financial, well, finance commissioner. Thank commission you very much, Hamza. Share resources. Thank Rather, you very let them much. use their resources. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you very much uh, for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.